Hi everyone, uh, this is Dr. Young again with Topics in Ancient World History. Um, I want to give in this video a very brief overview of ancient Greek history, mostly just to establish some periodization, um, to give a sense of the kind of general narrative of things, and to make a few comments. Um, this is going to be very brief. Uh, there will be more information later in the term about ancient Greece, looking at some specifics uh, within one or two of these periods. Um, but uh, I wanted to give a, a kind of general overview. The first thing that I uh, think needs to be said is that when we talk about Western civilization, and by Western civilization we mean the, uh, the civilization that eventually gave birth to, to Europe and, and its offshoots, including the United States, it's basically the, the civilization that uh, we in the U.S. Are, are part of, right, or that we are the heirs to. Um, uh, the, ver the foundation of Western civilization is ancient Greece. Um, and to be more specific, um, pretty much the entire intellectual tradition, right, the, the, uh, the tradition of uh, mathematics and science and philosophy and all of these things has its origins in ancient Greece. Um, with thinkers, obviously, like uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, but um, uh, even other thinkers that predated uh, Socrates, the pre-Socratic philosophers, are important in that regard. Um, and, uh, you know, that legacy of accomplishment in the field of, of philosophy and its, its kind of branches of things like mathematics and logic and, and what we would call science and, and all of that, right, uh, continued throughout the classical and Hellenistic ages, and, and Rome ended up being heir to much of that, right? So the, the intellectual tradition of the Western world is, is largely Greek in origin. Um, the other thing that is, the other kind of key component of Western civilization that's Greek is the, the spatial component. Um, the buildings that we occupy, the construction of, of physical spaces, the organization of towns and cities and things like that, right, is, is uh, Greek. Um, uh, and there are some kind of fundamental uh, institutions that, um, you know, most cities and, and governments and things like that have, uh, which go back to uh, experiments with these things in ancient, ancient Greece. Um, the tradition of uh, Western monarchy, the tradition of Western democracy, the tradition of representative governments, right? All of these things uh, have at, its, at their origins in Western civilization um, things that the ancient Greeks did. That said, there was a fair amount of diversity in ancient Greece, and, and uh, we shouldn't think that all of the Greeks were the same. Um, Greece, uh, as a, uh, a topography, meaning the, the physical uh, part of the landscape, is very mountainous. Um, it's made up of, uh, of islands and peninsulas, um, all of which were formed by volcanoes. The whole area is very seismically active with earthquakes and and uh, volcanic eruptions and things like that, uh, occasionally creating natural disasters. Um, and only about 20% of the land of ancient Greece um, was arable, meaning that uh, there was a scarcity of farmland and people tended to fight over the farmland. Um, so warfare was, was common, was even endemic. Um, and so, you know, that defines almost every period of Greek history. Let me go through the periodization very briefly here. The earliest layer of what we would call Greek civilization um, sprung up not in the Greek mainland, but rather on Crete, um, which is this island about uh, 120 kilometers, or about 75 miles, I think it is, uh, off the coast of the Peloponnesus or the southern part of the Balkan Peninsula where Greece proper is today. Um, Crete was uh, home to a people who have been called the Minoans. This is after the legendary King Minos and the Minotaur and that whole legend, that whole um, bit of, of Greek mythology. Um, but the Minoans had uh, a highly, from about uh, the first half of the second millennium BCE, so maybe 17, 1800 BCE or so, this is contemporary with somebody like Hammurabi, um, they had these institutions called palace complexes, which was uh, a town of sorts with a central structure 
that was almost certainly the home of the ruler, uh, in addition to being the economic center, the center of trade, and probably the center of any kind of religious observance that happened there as well. Um, on the northern shore of Crete, there was a place called Knossos, which seems to have been the most important of these palace complexes, but there were others that were probably subsidiary to them. Now, that culture, including the palace complex and, and um, all of its kind of attendant components, was exported to the Greek mainland, or rather, it probably, probably was copied. The main difference is on the mainland, uh, the palace complexes ended up having defensive wall networks, um, which indicates that they were probably fighting with each other. They did not have this on Knossos, probably because Crete, being so far off of the mainland and out in the middle of the sea, didn't have as much worry about being attacked. But there is good evidence that around 1500 or so BCE, that uh, Knossos was conquered probably by, almost certainly by, um, mainland Greeks from these more kind of militaristic and defense-minded uh, palace complexes. Um, and so, you know, we have there uh, this period called the Mycenaean Age, uh, which runs from about 1500 or so, or we could date it back a little bit earlier than that, but, you know, the conquest of Knossos is probably around 1500, to about uh, 1200 BCE or so. Um, and it was at that point that something we've already discussed happened, and that is there were these massive cataclysms all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the sea peoples, the, these kind of pirates, uh, were attacking uh, coastal settlements. And the archaeological record is clear. These Greek palace complexes were destroyed. Um, and the writing system that they had developed, um, which we can read, although there's, there aren't many, very many texts, and so it doesn't give us a lot of information about what was going on, um, but that that ability to write disappeared for about three to four hundred years. In fact, the Greeks lapsed back to a uh, an oral uh, kind of society. Um, we can see this development in their uh, things like the archaeological finds of material remains, um, the pottery, for instance, uh, of this period is very plain with little decoration. Over time, it starts to have some decoration. And it takes about 400 years for it to, again, have kind of uh, careful designs with artwork featuring animals and human figures and things like that, right? Why would the pottery be so plain and utilitarian? Well, probably because people lack security. You need leisure time um, and you need security to do things like art, right? Um, and so this period that has been labeled the Greek Dark Age from about 1200 BCE to about 800 BCE was a time, it seems at least, of great instability. Um, some archaeology and, and uh, again, the pottery finds and things like that provide some clues about this, but there was no writing, and so we don't know a lot about what was going on. Um, when the Greeks started writing again, they produced almost immediately some of the uh, core texts of Western civilization, including the works of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the works of Hesiod, um, the works and days and the theogony, um, which are kind of key, uh, sources for Greek mythology, right? Including the story of Pandora and the story of many of the Greek gods. Those are found in the works of Hesiod. Um, uh, and so, you know, why were, uh, the, why did these things, um, why were they generated spontaneously like that? Was it just incredible imagination from these two authors? Well, almost certainly not. These stories were probably told orally over the generations. There are even indications that they retain some memory of what the Mycenaean Greek world looked like. There are words in there that seem to, you know, be indicators of institutions that existed before this, right? And you can read about some of that in the textbook. Um, but uh, the period that proceeds, which kind of kicks off with the, you know, the writing down of these incredible mythological stories um, is called the Archaic Age. And during the Archaic Age, the Greeks were in a period of uh, formation, um, creating key institutions, uh, and kind of stabilizing the Greek world. The Greeks were also migrating um, all over the Mediterranean, outside of what we think of as Greece proper, forming colonies in Italy, um, as far west as um, what is now southern France and, and uh, even the Iberian Peninsula or Spain. Uh, they, they formed colonies, um, more colonies on Crete, colonies up into the Black Sea region, colonies on Cyprus, 
colonies in North Africa. Um, the, the city of Cyrene uh, in what is now Libya was a key Greek settlement of this period. Um, as, and that there was even a, a Greek colony all the way down in Egypt, right, in the Nile Delta. Um, and so the Greeks were moving all over the place. They were one of a number of people who were, a number of peoples, I should say, who were migrating all over the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians and the Etruscans and others were kind of doing the same thing, but the Greeks were probably the most prolific at this. And they were creating, as I said, key institutions. Some of these were local institutions, uh, the governments that would uh, um, be in charge of the individual Greek settlements, which grew into these things that uh, the Greeks called poles. Plur the singular of that is polis, P-O-L-I-S. Um, but uh, the tra usually the translation of polis is uh, city-state, right? So the Greeks were forming these city-states. Some of them opted for monarchy. Some of them kind of developed into these representative governments or oligarchies. Some of them represent, or Athens at least, and, and some of its offshoots uh, formed a democracy ultimately, right? And so that roughly 300-year period sees the formation of uh, really kind of the stabilization, I should say, of the Greek world and the formation of these key institutions. Some of these institutions, as I said, were local. Most of them were. Um, and people thought of themselves primarily with uh, by their association with the local. Um, Athenians thought of themselves as Athenian primarily rather than Greek. Um, so did the Spartans, so did the Corinthians, so did the Megarians, and, and so forth and so on. But there were institutions that united Greeks all over the place. The Greek language itself was a key uh, unifier. And then religious institutions like the, um, a good example would be the Temple of Delphi, which was a, dedicated to the god Apollo. Um, there was a prophetess uh, who inhabited that temple who was reputed to have powers of, of seeing the future. I mean, people went to consult her. Um, uh, for several hundred years, actually, there was, the, it was called the Oracle of Delphi, right? Um, and, and then things like uh, religious festivals, uh, like what we think of as the Olympic Games, right? Which is a festival dedicated to the god Zeus, held at Olympia. Um, and as part of that religious festival, there were athletic competitions of running and wrestling and chariot racing and boxing um, and uh, a few others, right? Throwing the discus and things like that. Okay, so... The Archaic Age sees the formation, the Classical Age sees the realization and the kind of fullest extent or the fullest development of all of these key institutions. This is when Athens and Sparta emerge as the, uh, the most important of these city-states and end up going to war with each other a couple of times. Uh, after the Greeks, in the early part of the Classical Age, right at the beginning of the Classical Age, around um, just after 500, they fought a series of wars against Persia, gained independence from most Greek speakers uh, all over the Aegean Sea. But then, you know, they, they couldn't help themselves but fight against each other. Um, and uh, a key moment in the middle of the Classical Age, late 5th century BCE, is the Peloponnesian War, which we'll have plenty to say about later in the term. Um, the Classical Age is brought to an end when uh, people from Macedonia, which is uh, the northern part of the Balkan Peninsula, ended up uh, coming into a dominant position in the Greek world. The Greeks considered, them so, considered the, the Macedonians to be barbarians, even though the Macedonians had adopted a lot of Greek culture. Philip of Macedon became the de facto master of the Greek world, um, using a combination of skillful military and, uh, and diplomacy. Um, and then his son, Alexander the Great, of course, uh, went on to conquer Persia. Um, to export Greek culture all over, not just the Mediterranean, but into Mesopotamia, Egypt, Persia, India, and, and you know, other places, right? Central Asia. Um, and so the last period of Greek history is what's called the Hellenistic Age. That means Greek-like. This is where Alexander the Great and his heirs um, ended up uh, taking Greek culture and mixing and merging it with the cultures of these other ancient civilizations to bring about a, a kind of new uh, fusion um, of the various uh, cultures and societies. Um, uh, and the Romans ended up being the heir to that, right? So there's a lot more, obviously, we could say about this. I've tried to do this as, as briefly as possible just to give you an indication um, and uh, to give you really kind of a sense of chronology. Um, if you have questions, please, you know, ask them. Uh, in in class on discussion boards or wherever you know you have a chance to do that, um, and we will delve more into detail, as I said later in the term, on specific times in ancient Greece.